What do we want? Uh, I'll show you if we get that far. Okay, uh, welcome back. Thanks for not dropping after your first test. Most of you did fine, honestly. Did I see your resignation? No. Um, I don't have them um, put into the, the grade book. You don't need to retake it. There's only one person in here I think should retake it. Wait till you get your overall grade on all of it. See you, how you feel. You may have. Just kidding. What? Like for real, kids? Like this person? Minus two, minus six, minus zero, minus three, minus three, minus three, minus one, minus six, minus one, minus zero, minus three. Like these are not that bad, you freaks. Minus five, minus zero. Okay, minus a lot. Minus. 10 minus two. Yeah, yours isn't even graded yet. <laughs> it was on the left side of my computer instead of the right. So minus zero. Anyway, I assure you, most of you did better than you thought. Like someone turned one in and they're like, that was terrible. I suck. They missed two total points. So get out of my house. All right. You'll get them back tomorrow. We'll talk about them tomorrow. If you're not in that little group, me plus Tom. Um, I put in there that there's two of the free response about the law of constant composition I took out. I don't think I really had to, but I did because I have feelings. Um, what's that? Is there a way you can get into that group? I have no idea. I'm, I was added by Haley. Um, so anyway, you did pretty good. Don't feel bad. On to chapter two. Shh. Chapter two and chapter three, I test together. If I remember right, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you think I would know? I'm in 19 years now, but sometimes I just change my mind. Anyway, here we go. Chapter two, here are the resources. If you are absent, because my amount of kids being gone now is actually going a lot higher. You got three emails today. Um, if you're gone, either Zoom live or watch the class recording. The class recording can be found in a couple of different ways. There'll be a page right in here. Oh, it's right there. This is from last year. There will be one for this year. All right. It'll just be right there. Chapter two class videos. Or you can go to your calendar. Um, and then... You click on the day. Hey, I hear noise. Boys that are ignoring me right over here. Yeah, no noise, like literally sign language. That's how you can talk to each other. Okay, so you go here. We are, whoa, why is it showing every single one now? That's annoying. But let's see here. So test review, it says test review, and then you got your video right there. Okay, so if you were gone September 13th, you could click on that and it would be right there. Fair enough. That's the number one thing to do. I have three emails today that says, hey, I am either positive or someone in my house is, so I'm not coming for 10 days and I don't know what to do. And I love the human race, but I want to hurt some people. So I feel like I've gone it over a few times what to do if you're stuck at home. Go to Canvas, find the date, click on it, and enjoy. Um, all right, now, uh, all right, chapter two, let's just dive in. Chapter two is 80% of stuff that's super quick and super easy and super mostly not tested and 20% of hard stuff. Okay, and unfortunately in this class, I rarely test you on the not hard stuff. I'm sorry about that. 
All right, let's jump in. So it's about atoms, molecules, and ions. There's some history of the atom. Um, and then, I don't know, there's some stuff. Chapters one, two, and three, we used to just skip in AP chemistry. Um, Cause everyone back then had to take chemistry first. So this one should absolutely be a review for the kids in front and for a couple more of you that already took chemistry. If it's not, it's okay, but should be. All right, I've talked a lot, but chapter two provides the foundation for many of the topics in AP chemistry. It is very important that you grasp this chapter. Like I would for sure at least skim the first three or four sections and then really hammer down on the other ones. Sorry, we were loud, we're heading away. You're a smexy beast. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what smexy means. I assume it means I'm good looking and I smell good. Okay. Uh oh, they went out right when the police officer was right there. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? No one knows that song. All right, here we go. Goals of chapter two, basic understanding of the history of the atom. Super basic. Next. Basic understanding of the periodic table, super basic, because we're going to spend uh, like all year talking about that. But generally speaking, this chapter, just kind of an idea. You need to know these are bold. These are harder. No properties and functions of the part of the atom, and they're not super difficult. And then calculate average atomic masses. Someone hit my car in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. You had a good day. All right, this one's really, it's different than something you've ever done before, but it's, it's not bad. Cations and anions, that's just knowing what they are, kind of how to predict what will become a cat or an anion. Then these are bold and underlined. They're really important. You gotta be able to name a given formula and it's tricky and there's no naming schemata in AP or write a formula from a name. You, you will use this all year, and this is the main part that will be tested um, and really most important part of this whole chapter right there. And then oxy anion nomenclature. It's a lot of words, but it's tricky. And then naming acids. So really, the first couple parts, I'm going to blow through them. You're going to enjoy them, I'm sure. And then we got to know the parts of the atom and all that below. But really, we got to know how to name and write formulas, that's our, our goal. Sound bueno? Okay, this QR code probably is to the notes. Um, I don't even know, I made it in 2019, but it probably takes you to the PDF of the notes if you just wanna follow along. Um, I don't, a lot of these slides, when I go fast, I don't even want you to write them down. <laughs> like, Cause I know they're not like rocket science and they're not on the test but their information. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm on a diet right now. So I was like, bull crap. <laughs> she did not just bring her. Where did, where did you even get that? How dare she? You don't eat that stuff, but fat guys like me do. All right, we ready? I hope that's a yes, because I'm moving on anyway. All right, this beautiful man right here is, is Joe Thomas. The one on the screen, though, that's John Dalton. <laughs> Whoa, why you leave it? <laughs> All right, the theory of the atom. John Dalton, he really is credited with most of this stuff because he's the one that published his papers. In science, there's a lot of people that came up with the same ideas, but the person that writes it down first gets credit. So here we go. The theory that atoms are the fundamental building block of matter reemerged in the early 18th century, championed by John Dalton. All right, we had scientists a long time ago, we had the dark ages, then we had a sort of the revolution or the science awakening, whatever, in the 1800s. John Dalton is credited with a lot of stuff. Okay, oh, we'll come back to that. This is kind of out of order. That probably should have been first. I'll fix this for next year. Here we go, sorry, we'll get back to John. 
Here are some vocab words. I'm not testing you on them, but I'm going to use them. Atom, nucleus, anion, cation, atomic number, element, mass number, isotope, A, M, U. I'll go over each of them, but we should know what an atom is. Nucleus is the center. An anion is an, uh, an atom that has gained an electron to become negative. A cation is an atom that has lost an electron to become positive. Not necessarily, so like on the board, like up and down. Um, they're, they can relate somehow, but they're not necessarily. Atomic number, whew, that's from the periodic table, like lithium is element number three, that's its atomic number. An element, we learned what that was, mass number, that's on the periodic table, that's the like, Lithium is 6.99 or 6.941. Isotope, we'll learn about it, but it's an atom with different numbers of neutrons. And AMU is short for atomic mass units. And that's where we find the mass by assuming the proton is, a, is one. The neutron is one and the electron is zero. We'll, we'll learn all of them, but there's some vocab I will use. If you get confused, make sure you read this section. All right right here. So Dalton had some ideas or postulates, and one of them was each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. So he came up with, or he really just wrote all these ideas down and then toured the, the world saying, I think these things are true. So he basically said all stuff's made out of small, small stuff. Okay. You don't have to write all these down, but you can if you want, but I'm going faster than you're going to write. Okay, he proposed that all atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and other properties. But the atoms of one element are different from the atoms of all other elements. Why is that there? Let me get that out of the way. Okay, now this to us is common sense. The hydrogen is hydrogen and it has its own properties and it's different than helium. But back at this point in time, they were still going off of Aristotle's ideas, which was that all stuff is fundamentally made out of the exact same thing called Heil. Um, but Dalton said, no, they each have their individual things. Now he had an experiment to prove this and I had a resource for this and I opened it up today and it's a flash file and moment of silence for flash files. They're gone. <laughs> Uh, I didn't even I didn't even realize they were flash all my life using that video. I didn't know it was flash. Um, I'll try and find it on the internet, but there's a way he proved this and it was pretty cool math. Um, all right, so the idea that one oxygen is the same as another oxygen, but different to a carbon is credited to Dalton and his experimentation. Um, all right, he, that's a cute picture. He uh, had the idea that atoms of an element are not changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. That was a belief at that time that the actual elements themselves changed, but he came up with the idea that they're just rearranged and that an element is neither created or destroyed. So they were just rearranged instead of completely changed in nature. So it wasn't a hydrogen atom turning to a water atom when it was around oxygen. It was hydrogen and oxygen rearranging the way they hang out to form the compound of water. All right, he came up with the idea or definition that compounds are formed when atoms of more than one element combine and that a given compound always has the same relative number and kinds of atoms. So this is the same video, kind of talks about this. Um, it talks about how C, oh, I am there. Okay, I'm not there, I'm stupid. Carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, they have different properties, but they're made out of the same elements, but it's just because the way um, it's their ratio changes their properties. All right, 
So then we have the law of constant composition. Does this sound familiar? Okay, so it's going to be in chapter two. All right, it has another name and it's also called the law of definite proportions. And it says that the elemental composition of a pure substance never varies. What we mean by that is that water, its elemental composition is always two H's and one oxygen. Okay, and that if it isn't, then we don't call it water. It's something different. Because we can have OH minus combined. But we don't call that water, even though it's O's and H's. It's a different substance called hydroxide. And we can have H3O plus. It's still an arrangement of H's and O's, but it's not water. It's called hydronium. A pure substance will have a constant elemental composition when we call those compounds. Oops. All right. This one is not from Dalton. This is Antoine Lavoisier. You don't have to know that name and don't try and spell it. But he came up with the law of conservation of mass or matter, and it will govern a ton of what we're doing. So the technical definition we have here is that the total mass of a substance present at the end of a chemical process is the same as the mass of a substance present before the process took place. So I'm going to use words. I don't know if I've used them yet, but they're written right here. Um, in a chemical reaction, we start with reactants. Have I said that yet in this class? And we end with products. So on the left side of a reaction, we have like H2 plus O2 and then an arrow. And we say H2O. On the left, we'd say the reactants, hydrogen and oxygen, form products of water. What this is saying in this chemical reaction, the mass of reactants will always be equal to the mass of the products. They have to be. Now, the atoms will definitely rearrange themselves, but the amount of atoms has to stay the same. We cannot create them or destroy them. Okay, so I have a question here for you to discuss. I have an Erlenmeyer flask right here that didn't turn out very well, but whatever. All right, then I have some vinegar. And then I'm going to add some baking soda. Now, I am going to find the mass of the baking soda and vinegar. So we're going to have BS plus vinegar goes to a mess. You with me? And I'm going to say that the mass of the baking soda and the vinegar separate was 100 grams. Then, I'm going to pour this in here, and then I'm going to weigh the Erlenmeyer flask after, and it's only going to weigh like 98 grams. So tell your partner how this can happen, and we didn't just ruin the world. Ready, go. All right, my partner's a genius and her partner's out of town. So we'll work together for a little bit. We'll have you and Keely talk because Keely's probably sick of talking to me, right? You don't have to say yes. All right, Brown said that the gas got out. How many of you said that? Okay, gas left the system. Does that mean I ruined the, or I broke the law of conservation? No, I just, there was some mass that escaped. So if I like put a balloon here and kept the gas in, then I'd be fine. So sometimes there is a change in what we think is the mass of the products and the reactants, but we have to account for all states, like some gas escaping. No big deal, we're good. So the application of this is 
what we're going to do all year and you're going to love it and that's balancing reactions we had just a, the tiniest taste of this ever when i used electrolysis to decompose water right we had h2o went to h2 plus o2 Ooh, let's remind your lab partner why these are twos why don't you remind Keely, or Keely, you can remind Samantha, Samantha, right? Yeah. Or just Sam? Um, either, sorry. Okay. Do you remember why? Do you remember why? Yeah. 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 And the words diatomic. All right, here we go. So both of these atoms are happier when they're with one of their twins and they're called diatomic okay so when we did this reaction i wrote it out and i didn't worry about it but then i said later hey we got issues here this reaction does as written it does violate the law of conservation of matter right there's two h's two h's but two o's and one o so we doubled the amount of this to make two o's so that's good but then that meant I had to have four H's. I'm ready to roll. Now, this reaction has to obey the law of conservation of matter. The amount of H's is four. The amount of H's on the right is four. The amount of O's is two because of this, right? And two because of two times one. Who's with me? Nobody? Raise your hands if you're okay so far. I'll assume everyone behind me raised their hand. Okay, so we are going to apply this every time we balance a reaction. I know that isn't very pleasing to my eyes. Um, all right, next. This is ugly too. Ooh. All right, so this PowerPoint kind of jumps around. It goes with the chapter, so you should read it. But so, so far what we've talked about are just some ideas about the atom, but now we're gonna talk about specific parts of the atom. So John Dalton said that the, the all matter is made up of atoms and it was basically just this picture of a blob. It's like, I don't know what they look like. I can't know what they look like. There's no microscope that will look at it in the 1800s, okay? So they have to come up with other ways to research it. And so a guy named J.J. Thompson, and I have to point out for all the Thompsons everywhere, there was no P in his last name, all right? I promised Garrett and Isaac and Caleb and Stephen that I would always point out there's no P in J.J. Thompson's name. All right, he's credited with discovering the electron by being a weirdo and lighting up this thing with electricity and playing with a magnet. So, but who doesn't want to do that, right? So we're going to do that real quick. So this isn't like the most amazing thing, but this thing right here is called a cathode ray tube. And I, there's no way I'm going to get it high enough um, for everyone to see. Hold on. There it is. Uh, no, no, yes, okay, here we go. All right, so just for a second, and the people online, make sure you remind me to share the screen again. All right, I need to see that. Okay, so what I have right here, other way, is a cathode ray tube. It's very similar to what J.J. Thompson used to discover the electron. So what he did, he took a battery and he connected it to one of these things and passed electricity through here. He got it to arc. 
And then he studied how it messed around in a magnet, magnetic field. This is a Tesla coil. And you should be able to see a green line. Oh, the camera doesn't do any good. I promise you people online, there's a green line right here, right? Hold on. We're gonna zoom in on my amazingly crafted physique here. <laughs> oh well, it glows. All right, it's like Rudolph's nose. Okay, so I have this green line, and if I take a magnet, I can make that line go. And I can't see it, but do you see it moving? Yeah. All right. It's behind a metal, a piece of metal. So I can't really tell if it's moving, but it is, right? It looks to me like it's going down, is that right? Okay, if I come over here, it goes up, right? So JJ Thompson discovered that whatever this beam, this arc was made out of, it could be deflected by a magnet. Let me come back here. Oof, my beautiful children. Then let me come back here and share the screen. All right, so here's what, what he discovered. He used a, a battery, because in 1897, you couldn't just plug it into the 120 volt thing in the front of your lab room, right? All right, he had a very highly charged, probably lead acid battery, produced this, got a spark and deflected it. And he studied it and discovered, that the ray would go towards the north, away from the south, or if you had a plus or a minus, it would go uh, towards the positive and away from the negative. I didn't say that very well because I just said it wrong. It's okay. So the beam would come through. We have the positive here. It would go this direction when this was on. You with me? Okay. When it was off, it would go this way, this straight. If he spun it, it would go the other direction. So he discovered this beam was made out of something that was attracted to positive and repelled by the negative. So he knew the charge of this beam had to be overall what? Tell your partner. If it's attracted to the positive, it had to be the opposite. So it had to be the negative. You sort of with me? Okay. Now, at this point in time, they didn't really know much about the atom, but now we had this idea that there must be some sort of flow in charge that can be affected uh, by a plus or a minus. So he's going to call them corpuscles and that they're negative. And eventually that name turned into the electron, okay? Thompson measured the charge mass ratio of the electron to be super small. This is not a number that you need to know but it's 1.76 times 10 to the negative eight coulombs. Don't worry about that. All right, but he, he found out they're extremely small. Uh, and it doesn't really say it, but he also found out that they are negatively charged. So from all this, you don't need to know a ton except for JJ Thompson is credited with discovering the electron. And the two things he discovered about it, it was negative. Um, and it was really small. What time do we get out of here on a Wednesday? Huh? Anybody know? Okay, what kind of lab part? One o'clock? Okay, just kidding. You're awesome, I'm sure. Okay, now, Millikan. Millikan is not one you are usually required to know, but Millikan did something pretty cool and he had something to do with BYU, which I don't really care about, but people like to say that that's important. Okay. <laughs> Here's Millikan's oil drop experiment. What he was able to do was actually calculate the charge on a specific 
electron. It's really genius. What he, dis, what he did, he took oil spray and put it in a thing that turned them into an extremely small, fine mist or an atomizer. Now, there's no way he could get it small enough that there was only one atom, but it was really, really small droplets of oil. And then he had a hole in this metal disc right here so that they would fall through in a straight line. All right. Then he had a microscope, which he would look through right here. And then he had a source of x-rays right here. Probably died from eye cancer, but whatever. They didn't know that was a thing back then. So what the x-rays would do, it would ionize these things, which means it would make them charged. Okay. So this little droplet falls through and then they give it a charge. And so now Millikan, and really it was the people that worked for him in his lab, what they would do, they would look through and they would turn these plates on specific voltages until the droplet stopped moving and just stayed in one place. All right. And they came up with the idea that if they could make this float, then they had a negative charge here, a negative charge here. They assumed that they were giving it the exact same charge it had, and it was repelled equal to its mass. Now, I don't know if that makes perfect sense, but it's kind of genius. He was stopping, he was overcoming gravity with a negative charge. Okay, so what they did, they did this a thousand or more times. They did this experiment and they got all these numbers. I'm just gonna make some up. I'm gonna say like 120, 142, 186, 38, 56, 202. And they said, these numbers all suck. <laughs> like they, they're not the same. But then some genius named Millikan said, they are not the same. But every one of these is a number of a same, or a multiple of a really small number, which is two. Now I know one, but that's like spoiler alert. Every number is divisible by one. So he said this. So he think like, Think about his logic here. You guys are geniuses. These things are charged because they have electrons on them, right? Can they control how many electrons get on there? No. But they wrote all these down and they figured out all the numbers of charges were divisible by one really small number. And so they came up with the idea that that small number must be the charge of one electron. And that the bat blob must have had 60 on it. That one had 71 on it. That one had 19. You with kind of that logic? This is a really big idea, by the way, in science. It's called quantization. And it's where a value is always divisible by one really small value. Um, energy is quantized. Uh, we call it the quantum, all right? So he did this experiment and discovered the charge on a single electron, and it's probably on the next slide. It's not two, I promise you that. Uh, okay, never mind, whatever. More about Millikan, University of Chicago. But once again, the other teacher used to teach at BYU, or she graduated from BYU, and she'd always flex on me. I don't even know. Do you know, Tiffany? The Millikan has something to do with BYU. Yeah, and I don't either, and I didn't care. But yeah, clearly, if it's from BYU. Uh, just kidding. Wow, the number's not here. I can't, it's like 1.84 times 10 to the 19 coulombs. Not a number you need to memorize. What? Oh, he's a BYU alumni. I'm surprised any of them ever amounted to anything. Uh, <laughs> JK, BYU's amazing. They just wouldn't accept me because I wasn't smart. So I am bitter. Even though it was my choice, it's not theirs. Okay, I don't remember the value. 
it's a number we're going to learn in chapter 21. So all in favor of not worrying about it until chapter 21, raise your hands. Okay, me too. All right, but do know it has a charge. All right, Henry Becquerel and Marie and Pierre Curie were the people that discovered radioactivity. So just for a second, we had Dalton. And he said the atom is this. Oops. Then over time, we have J.J. Thompson. And he said, I don't know much about the atom, but I do know it has electrons in it. Okay, then we're going to have radioactivity up into this point, Dalton and JJ and all of them thought the atom was really made out of just something that wasn't break downable. That it was one thing that didn't have parts. Well, these three, when they discovered radioactivity, they realized that there is other parts of the atom that there are other parts of the atom. So radioactivity is really where the atom starts to be more defined. So what had happened, Henry Becquerel was a photographer taking pictures of scientific experiments and his film was getting fogged. Now we use digital cameras, but back then film only um, worked when you exposed it to light. Like you kept it dark, you opened the shutter for a second and then it was exposed, chemical reaction happened and you had a picture. Well, he was taking plates that were overexposed by these experiments and thought, I wonder what in the world's happening. Um, so he didn't expose them at all. He just had them by the experiment, found that they were exposed and came up with the idea that there's something in dirt that was giving off stuff like light that was not light. Question or you're good. All right. So he knew something was coming out of there. The Marie and Pierre, or sorry, <laughs> Marie and Pierre Curie, they studied farther and were able to isolate three elements. Um, it cost her her life. I don't remember if Pierre died from cancer or not, um, but they came up with the idea that whatever the atom is, we know it has electrons, but it must be break apartable. It's divisible. It had to be. Go ahead. The radium. Yeah, that's one of the things she discovered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the radium girl plays. They discovered that radium glowed in the dark. And so they would paint it on watches. Um, and they'd have these women that would paint watch faces all day. Yeah, radium girls. And so they would have their like paint brush and they needed it extremely fine. So what they would do the girls would lick it and then dip it in the radium and paint these very precise lines on the watch faces. And then they lick it, do it again, lick it, do it again. They had no idea they were ingesting radioactive material and it killed most of them. Now they didn't know at all. Even like years later, this is a really cool idea, except for it was killing people. You used to be able to go to the store put your foot in an x-ray box and see how the shoe fit, like with your bones. How cool is that? Because it was killing people. It was killing the workers. They were being exposed to radioactivity every single day. But yeah, you could just slide her in there and move your toes around like, oh, it, it does fit very nice. Huh. Who would have known? All right, so the early days of radioactivity, Pretty cool, really, really dangerous because they didn't know what they were discovering would, would kill them. Um, yes? When did they figure out it worked? Probably within 10 years when, started when people died. <laughs> and they thought, all right, they use a scientific method. Our problem is all the nuclear scientists are dying. Let's figure this problem out fast. So, yeah, it didn't, it probably didn't take them a long time to realize that it was. It was toxic. It was a completely new illness, radioactive poisoning. Um, if anyone had had it before, it was completely by accident and not really traceable. But these people were refining nuclear material to study it. 
And nowadays, like we know that is super, super bad. And it's unfortunate for, for these pioneers. Whenever you're the first to do something, there's always risks and you don't know what they are. Um, all right. So three types of radiation were discovered by Ernest Rutherford. So it's tricky. These people knew there was radiation. Rutherford studied it and discovered there was at least three. There turns out to be more, but three main ones. All right, and they are, the symbols are missing. It's okay. They are the alpha particle. It looks like that. Like a, one of these hope ribbons, but sideways. The other one was the beta particle. Oh, you can see them right here. That just says rays on all of them. I don't know. But it's like a cursive looking B. And then gamma rays are like a weird looking Y ish. Alpha, beta, and gamma. Sounds like a sorority, but it's not. It's the three types of radiation. And this is something you should definitely know for your exam or for the AP test. Um, and what you need to you know their names and their properties. Okay, so Ernest Rutherford, he took some lead and he put a radioactive substance in it and had this hole drilled. And he was trying to collimate it, which means make it go out in only one line to study, similar to Millikan, All right? So they sent this through and he sent it through another sheet of gold with a little hole in it. So it was really just one fine line of radiation. Instead of it going everywhere, he just wanted the center to straight line. Okay, so he fires this through. And then once again, he's gonna connect it to a positive and negative plate that's connected to a battery. As this single line of radiation flowed through this electrical field, one of them went this way, one of them went straight through and one of them went down here. So we have beta, gamma, and alpha rays. From this picture, I want you to think and then discuss the following question. I want to know the charge of all three of them, positive, negative, or neutral. And I want to know your guess of the relative size, which one's the biggest, which one's the smallest. See if you can figure that out based on this picture. All right, you and Sam talk once you've thought it out. Have fun? Good. Seriously, can I sit here? All right. What do you think? Nice. Nice. Gamma. Gamma. Okay. The size is harder, right? Okay, let's talk about it. So my new lab partner, she said betas are negative. Who agrees with that? Raise your hands. Good. Now, science is all about knowing the answer and knowing why. We can predict it's negative because it goes towards the positive side in a way. Because likes repel, opposites attract. Okay, so that's negative. That must mean alpha are positively charged. Okay, now that would mean gamma is neutral. Okay, then... Well, that looks a lot like metal, but it says neutral. Yes. Um, does neutral have like a specific sign to show it's neutral? Or just just it's nothing. Not. Nothing. You can put a zero if you want, zero. but it doesn't really matter. Okay. The size is a little bit harder to figure out. Anybody willing to risk their social nerdness? Back row first. You think 
Beta is the biggest because they are influenced the most. Okay. Please openly disagree. Say it louder for me. Okay, it's it's awesome. One of you's right, one of you's wrong, but you both have the right explanation. Wouldn't the bigger one have more electrons than the one that more? That's a theory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bigger the muscle, the more the flex for those that are uh, on the Zoom. Okay, here's the answer. And Corbin's the correct one. It's beta is way smaller than alpha. And so when they come through, beta is bent more because it has less mass. This would be like the skinny kid running through the tackle. He's gonna get hit a lot farther than the not skinny kid, okay? So beta theoretically has a mass roughly equal to 10 to the negative 24 kilograms. Now you don't have to really have that memorized, but that's pretty small, right? Gamma has a mass pretty much of zero because it's not a thing. <laughs> it's energy. It's not, a, it's not a particle, it's just energy, all right? Alpha has a mass Roughly four. For what? <laughs> Good question. Four AMUs. AMU. Four AMU means atomic mass units. Go ahead. How does the program convert it to the AMU units? Yep, this unit in AMUs is pretty much zero. Now, here's the real truth. One AMU is roughly 2,000 times bigger than zero. Now, I know that sounds weird, like 2,000 times zero is nothing, but really 2,000 times bigger than that really, really small number. So they're both extremely small numbers, but one is a lot bigger than the other. You okay with that? I know it's kind of weird, but that's sort of how it works. Okay, alpha looks like a sideways ribbon or a fish. Beta, a fat cursive B. And gamma, I just kind of do the weird looking Y. Now, their order of energy, and I'm gonna say like whether they can kill you or not. Gamma kills you the fastest. That's what made Hulk green. Well, you don't wanna mess with that, all right? Beta, hardly bad at all, but sort of bad. And alpha, not even remotely bad. Alpha are so big and slow and low energy that these are what we use in fire alarms, smoke alarms, technically. The smoke alarm has an alpha emitter, a tiny little piece of americium and it emits alpha particles. And there's a sensor right here. And as long as this sensor senses alpha particles, life's great. But then you burn your popcorn in the microwave and your smoke interrupts the alpha particles. Smoke can stop an alpha particle. Well, then the sensor doesn't sense. And now you're that guy that set the fire alarm off over your popcorn, okay? Now, so. I actually don't like microwave popcorn, but I have set the alarm off in here because I'm cool like that. All right, most of everything I just said will not be on your test, but it's kind of interesting information to keep here. All right, you said one o'clock. Can I trust that person? All right, I'll post this. It was good to have a couple of you online. We were up to three, I think. Um, if you have any questions, hit the chat, but I'm going to probably stop it pretty